Good. Hi. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Jim Lewis. I work here. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, MLAT reform, which is a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart, and I expect to all the panelists as well. We have their bios on our website, so I won't go through them, but what we will do today is the following. Um, I'm going to say welcome to CSIS. Then I'm going to turn it over to David Sullivan to make some uh, introductory remarks. Then we'll have Andrew Woods present on the report, and then we'll have a panel discussion that I hope can be interactive. So feel free to ask any questions that might come up. I'll each each of the panelists to speak briefly, five minutes max, on the subject, and then we'll open it up to a back and forth. So with that, let me turn it over to David. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're delighted you could join us today for uh, the release of our new report, uh, Data Beyond Borders, Mutual Legal Assistance in the Internet uh, Era. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to say a few words uh, about the Global Network Initiative. Uh, so GNI brings together leading ICT uh, companies uh, with human rights organizations, uh, socially responsible investors, and academics uh, around a set of principles on freedom of expression and privacy uh, grounded in international human rights standards. Um, we provide guidance for the companies that are on the receiving end of government requests uh, that may impact the privacy or freedom of expression rights of their users. And we have an independent assessment process that sort of takes a look under the hood at how our member companies are actually implementing those principles and guidelines in practice. Equally important, uh, GNI brings together uh, that diverse uh, membership uh, to engage in shared learning uh, and collaboration on policy engagement, uh, and that's really why we're here today. Um, improving the legal frameworks uh, that um, govern requests for data across jurisdictions uh, is a key priority that's really emerged out of our shared learning, uh, and we believe that uh, Andrew's report really off provides a promising basis for policy reforms uh, and a mutually beneficial approach to mutual legal assistance reform. Um, so big thanks to Andrew for all the work that he's done putting this report together and for everyone who uh, worked with him on it. And I just wanted to thank Jim and the Strategic Technologies Program uh, at CSIS for hosting us today. Uh, and without further ado, I'll turn things over to Andrew. Thanks. Great, thanks David for the introduction. And thanks Jim and CSIS for hosting us. And thanks to all of you for being here to discuss the oh-so-sexy topic of mutual <laughs> legal assistance treaties. I, I do think it's hard to imagine that if we had this panel 10 or 20 years ago that many, as many people would be in the room, so I'm, I'm glad to see that you're here. I think it speaks to the timeliness of the topic. I'm especially heartened that you came here given all of the other competing cyber events that are going on today. Um, I wonder if maybe the coffee is better at CSIS or you just wanted to check out the new building, but I don't care why you're here. I'm glad you're here. Um, I want to leave the bulk of the time to get some feedback on the report and, and to hear from you about your questions or comments on the, on the topic, but I do want to make a few points, and as a newly minted law professor, I feel compelled to make exactly three points. So the first uh, that I'll address is why this topic now, so I'll say just a bit about why we felt it was important to, to address the question of MLATs in 2015. Second, I'll say a bit about the report's findings and its scope, and then I want to end by just noting some of the things that are left out of the report that I think require further research and attention. <clears throat> okay, so why does this matter? Why MLATs in 2015? If you were a law enforcement officer in India or Brazil 50 or even 30 years ago, you could have done your job effectively without ever leaving the state's borders. That's really not true anymore. Um, as we increasingly live our, live our lives online with data scattered across different jurisdictions, law enforcement, as Gail, I think, will probably tell us, increasingly needs to cross jurisdictional boundaries to get access, lawful access to data to pursue and prosecute routine crimes. Um, the question how you get access in, this, in a lawful manner without stepping on another state's jurisdictional toes is the subject of the report. And, and the, the view of the report is that the mutual legal assistance process offers a legitimate um, and promising approach to dealing with these cross-jurisdictional requests for data. Um, the, gov the mutual legal assistance process is largely governed by a patchwork of bilateral and, in some cases, multilateral agreements between states that are known as MLATs, or mutual legal assistance treaties. 
But the regime that's made up of these agreements is, as my economists, my economist friends say, suboptimal. It's extremely slow. Requests can take months, and in some freak scenarios, uh, even years to come through. And there are a number of problems associated with the requests. They're often badly formatted or badly processed by the intaking state. Um, you might think that this is ultimately a good thing. If you care about privacy, you might think, oh, this means that states are not getting access to personal data, and since you don't want states to get access to personal data, that's a good thing. Um, but that's a very naive view of the world, right? We, we know now that, that, that MLATs are not the only way that governments can get access to data. And in fact, when the MLA process does not work well, governments resort to other tactics, often less savory tactics. So for example, governments may attempt to apply their laws extraterritorially in an effort to avoid having to go through the MLA process. They might demand data localization, storing some data within their borders so that they can more easily surveil it or take it. Uh, and they may even resort to surveillance. Surveillance is not just a tool for governments to get access to things that they don't think they lawfully have access to. It's also a tool that governments can sometimes use when they are just frustrated by the means of getting access to the data lawfully. <clears throat> a few months ago, I was at a conference and I spoke to someone at an unnamed company that sells a tool that governments can use, they buy the software off the rack, for intercepting communications. So I asked the guy, have you ever heard of mutual legal assistance treaties? And this big smile shows up on his face and he says, I love MLATs because states are so frustrated with the MLA process, they buy my software to get access to the data that they would otherwise have to request through MLA and wait nine months for. That to me is a terrifying prospect, right? Not that the state is using surveillance to get access to stuff they shouldn't have access to, but they're just frustrated enough with the legitimate means for getting access to data that they might do something like surveillance. Um, so the, the key point there is to see that there's this hydraulic relationship between some of the deepest challenges to internet governance, like debates over jurisdiction and debates over um, data localization, and the, the smooth functioning of the MLA regime. So that's why we thought this would be a timely report. What does the report aim to do? The report, um, to prepare the report, I'll just say a bit about the methodology. I spoke with my co-panelists, and I spoke with dozens of people at the law and policy teams at dozens of telecommunications companies, internet companies that operate around the world. I spoke to members of civil society groups in the global north and the global south, spoke to law enforcement agents at dozens of countries, and a number of diplomatic officers. And the report tries to take what is a very complex issue and identify some of the simplest things that seem to be wrong with it that we could address with simple tools. Um, so the report first identifies key principles that we think ought to inform uh, any reform effort, and then identifies what are the lowest hanging fruit uh, reforms that could be implemented by a government that, that wants to take steps to reform the MLA process. The key principles, I won't go into these in any detail, but just so you know what they are, the key principles are, there are five, uh, justified and proportional access, governments ought to have access to data that they are, that, that is uh, proportional to how much interest they have in the data, and if the, the, uh, the government's request for the data is in fact justified. So it's not enough to say, we really want that data. It has to also, you have to also make out the case for something like probable cause. Uh, another key principle is human rights protections, which have to be baked into the MLA process, so that when a country requests data from another country, they, they are making guarantees that the data will not be used in a way that would be Viol uh, violative of human rights. The process needs to be more transparent than it is currently. The process needs to be many more times more efficient. And just as important as increasing its efficiency, the process needs to be scalable, because I think we all agree that the number of requests for government-to-government -government assistance in, in pursuance of personal data in connection with criminal matters is going to rise exponentially. I mean, if, if the curve is like this, I think we're right here, and the, the mountain is, um, is soon to, to hit. Okay, so these are some of the key principles. What are the key reforms? The easiest reforms, the reforms that I think are uncontroversial, that can be implemented by governments starting tomorrow, are the following three. The first is to make this process largely electronic, which means using forms for uniform requesting format, provisioning of evidence in a digital format. Much of this stuff already exists, but only in certain 
um, one-off scenarios. So one trusted member of one government working with another trusted member of another government might create a smooth pathway, but there is in no way a uniform and consistent way for, for managing MLA requests in an electronic way, um, electronically. The second thing that needs to happen is we need considerably more uh, manpower, more manpower dealing with MLA, so better staffing. And this is something that any of you who work in DOJ know well, right? There's just, there are not enough people managing the incoming requests to process them efficiently. The last thing that needs to happen is MLA training. And this is true for both countries that request mutual legal assistance and the countries that receive incoming requests for mutual legal assistance, right? Better training would make the process go much more smoothly. Better training meaning when you make a request for data from another government, make sure that you have stated, for example, that you have probable cause. If you're asking for data, if you're asking the United States government to compel a company that's in the United States to produce data, you need to not only articulate why you want the data, but also that you have probable cause for the data. Um, lots of requests get kicked back or are delayed needlessly because the people who make the request or the people who process the request just haven't had adequate training to, to, um, to make the process function smoothly. Okay, so this is what the, this is the, the, largely the contribution I think the report makes is to identify these very simple and uncontroversial reforms to the MLA process. Um, reforms that I'm, I'm sure some of you in the room already are aware of. Uh, there are a number of things that the report leaves out and I just wanna highlight these before I turn to my co-panelists for feedback. Um, it's, it's hard to know even where to begin what the report leaves out because this is such a huge and complicated topic. And in many, tapes, take, in many respects, this was a simple take on a, on a relatively complex topic. Um, but let me just say two things that are mentioned in the, top, in the report, but which I think deserve more attention, then I'll just discuss two things that are not at all in, in the report, but are, merit further attention. The first thing the report touches on, but doesn't spend a, enough time dealing with, is international agreements to guide this process. Right? The, the MLA process is the, largely the result of mutual legal assistance treaties, international agreements, and those agreements could be reformed in a number of fruitful ways. That reform may take a while, which is, it's just not the lowest hanging fruit, which is why the report doesn't spend as much time on it as the reforms I just described. But ref implementing mutual legal assistance treaties where they don't exist and reforming them where they do exist is a, is a critical project that merits further attention. The second thing that I think merits further attention is the devising of plurilateral or multilateral treaties to address the sharing of gov the government to government requests for personal data. Um, this is something Microsoft has pushed for. It's a very ambitious project to think about what a global or regional agreement um, or regime would look like for managing these requests. And there are costs associated with it, but I think it's worth thinking ambitiously about what such a regime would look like. Both of them, though these things are mentioned in the report, but not fully fleshed out. Two things the report leaves out completely, but I think are critical to this conversation are jurisdiction, the state's jurisdiction over what kinds of data it can compel, and dual criminality, or conflicts of laws. So jurisdiction, the report really only focuses on what happens once you decide that a state must ask another state for assistance to compel data. It doesn't tell you what are the boundaries of a state's authority to compel the data directly, right? That is a huge open question about which lots of people disagree. The report doesn't touch it. In many respects, it's the elephant in the room. And I don't expect it to be resolved anytime soon. I think we could have a fruitful conversation about the, the smooth functioning of MLA, assuming that MLA needs to happen because we're talking about government to government interactions. But this question of jurisdiction is a big one and it's worth spending a lot of time thinking about. The second thing the report doesn't talk about, but which I think needs to be a great deal of research needs to be done on is the deeper question of dual criminality or conflicts of laws. So the, the deepest, most intractable problem of mutual legal assistance in many ways is when two countries just disagree about what's illegal, right? So if, for example, a French government, the French government asks the U.S. to compel, um, asks the U.S. to compel a company to release data in connection with speech that is a hate crime, punishable, in France, but not in the United States. How do you resolve that tension? How do you create a regime that resolves that tension in a way that is satisfactory to the values of the United States and the values of the French? That is a deep, intractable problem that this report doesn't, doesn't attempt to solve, and I think um, merits further attention. 
But those deeper problems we can set aside for now. I and mean, one of the one of the compelling things to me about this report is that there are so many non-controversial, non-intractable, immediately actionable things associated with MLA that we can all agree on that we can implement tomorrow. Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll we'll get some feedback on on what it would look like to implement those tomorrow um, from the panelists. Thank you. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to moderate what I'll do is uh, quickly uh, introduce the panelists. Um, I'll, I'll note a couple of things that might be worth bearing in mind when you talk about this, and I think Andrew touched on them. There's this concept called sovereign equality, which is basically that we're talking about sovereigns cooperating with each other. And under international law, sovereigns are equal, so you can't compel people to do things. You can compel them if you want to invade them or coerce them or stuff like that, but we're not going to be doing that for MLATs. You have the tension between sovereignty and universal rights. One of the big changes, and this is where we're interested at CSIS, is in the last couple of years, countries have discovered sovereignty and it, how it applies to um, cyberspace or the internet or whatever, and countries are looking for ways to accept, extend sovereignty but what we don't have is good ways for sovereigns to cooperate. And this is a, a premier example. Even though we have things like the Budapest Convention, um, which some countries like and others don't, we have the alleged Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and they have an agreement. So there's multiple models out here for how to do this, right? And hopefully we can get into some of that, because I think at the end of the day, it is how you're going to accommodate sovereignty uh, on a global network and at the same time take universal values into account that will be so important when we don't have political agreement. And I think that was touched on in the report, but that's one of the fundamental things here. We don't have political agreement on how this new thing should be governed, how sovereigns should cooperate. Um, we have uh, four respondents, um, not in order on my sheet, but uh, I'll read it anyhow. Uh, we have Gail Kent from the UK National Crime Agency. She'll be giving an international perspective. Um, we have uh, Nicole Jones from Google, who, of course, has a big interest in this stuff. Uh, Sarah St. Vincent from CDT, the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, my favorite uh, privacy organization, and probably, probably one of the best, if not the best. And then uh, Frank Torres from Microsoft, who will talk about their view. So we've got uh, two companies, uh, one government, and one uh, civil society respondent. To make it easy, why don't we just go down the row and start with uh, Sarah, and that way it'll be easier to keep track. So Sarah, if you could talk for a few minutes, and then we'll go down. Sure, um, and I would like to echo what Andrew said, that as an international lawyer, it just makes my heart glad to see this many people in a room to talk about treaties. Um, although one thing I want to stress from the start is it's we're, what we're not talking what we're talking about is really not treaties we're going to talk about individual rights and I think that's really key to keep in mind as we proceed um, but first I want to say congratulations to both Andrew and GNI on an excellent report if you haven't read it I would strongly recommend it it's very clear very well done and as Andrew has highlighted it really pulls out a couple of not easy but straightforward doable reforms that could be done within a year that we think are, are quite not simple, but as I said, certainly doable and extremely important. Uh, we were part of the consultation process that led to the report, and that was really a privilege, just as it's a privilege to be here today. Uh, I should say that I think, like many in civil society, as of about maybe seven or eight months ago, MLETs weren't really on our radar yet. Um, in fact, my colleague Greg Nojaim and I looked at each other as we were doing some strategic planning, and we said, MLATs, we wrote it down with a question mark because we didn't really know what they were or why they were important. We had heard of them, we understood that they might be significant in some respect. Uh, but as we started to study the problem, we realized just how important it was. And I think we weren't alone in civil society in coming to realize that these are really key to guaranteeing individual rights and that the problems that arise because of the broken nature of the system are really pretty severe. Um, and so I think one of the things that really kicked this off for us and helped us to understand the import of this issue was the Microsoft Ireland case, which I'm sure others will talk about. For anybody who's not familiar, that case involves a, a, a US effort to have a US warrant reach into Ireland to get data stored on Microsoft servers in Ireland. So basically an attempt to issue an extraterritorial warrant. Um, so that along with the GNI consultation really 
kickstarted us, helped us understand how important this issue is in a world where, as Andrew has said in his report, evidence is basically internationalized. Um, this is just where we are today. Fortunately, as we started to look into this and really to work with it, we discovered that MLATs and the problems that are arising from them are not that difficult to understand. Um, here's this process. I mean, it's one that does have a number of shortcomings, which I'll get to in a moment, but it provides a lawful way for states to obtain evidence from one another. There's a clear agreement, it's written down, it's published, you can look at it, very transparent. Um, and it does so in a way that has full respect for binding laws of state sovereignty, which is really the bedrock of the entire international legal order and incredibly important. Um, and I think MLATs are also key to advancing a set of human, the, the set of human rights that we in the US think of as due process, and then in Europe tend to be more described as fair trial, say. I, so I wanna be clear that we think that in accordance with international law, US warrants don't and shouldn't have extraterritorial reach. So we think going through the MLAT process is really the only way to go. Um, and this is one reason both the Microsoft Ireland case and the MLAT issue in general are very important to us. Uh, of course, when we went out and spoke to people in the industry and to DOJ and to other civil society groups, we quickly learned that MLATs, as this report highlights, are urgently in need of certain reforms in order to be effective in a world where requests for electronic data, especially electronic data stored in the US, are just ballooning. And accordingly, the work for, for DOJ and other entities that handles, handle these requests is ballooning. Um, and we think the GNI report highlights the most important of these reforms very effectively, especially when it comes to need for basic things like an electronic request system, a tracking system, so law enforcement in various countries can see what happens to their request after they've made it, a standardized form available in the six UN languages at least. All these things that kind of seem intuitive uh, but haven't been done yet. And also I think the report is right in highlighting greater transparency across the board. I think that will help everyone, including individual users, to have more confidence in what's going on. I, I do want to point out that the MLAT process is not available to defendants. It's only available to the prosecution. And that is a really serious shortcoming of the system. Um, and I think the, the report is also correct to point out that if we can manage to get new or revised MLATs or an updated process, it needs to include human rights protections explicitly. Some of the MLATs, some of the treaties, when you look at them, they do have some protections that are implicit. For example, I think there are some treaties that deal with the type of scenario where a country is requesting materials that in the US for First Amendment reasons we might not disclose. But there's a whole range of human rights protections that relate to prosecutions and trials that really ought to be um, in these treaties or in the relevant agreements. Um, and then I think we would add also that we support a warrant requirement for MLAT requests no matter that reach the US, um, or sorry, that originate in the US as well. So right now, if you have a request coming into the US from another country, uh, a warrant has to be obtained from a U.S. court. But if you have U.S. authorities requesting data from another country, they don't have to go to the U.S. court and get a warrant first, and we think that they really ought to have to do that. So again, we think warrants are, are a wonderful tool and really a necessary one. Um, and uh, to add to that, we support a warrant requirement for all third-party disclosures of electronic data. So I'll just say that. This is something that's coming up in relation to a bill called the Leeds Act. It, uh, it stands for Law Enforcement Access to Data Stored Abroad. Uh, Senators Hatch, Coons, and Heller have proposed that. Uh, and the bill would do that. It would, it would basically require, require companies to require a warrant before they disclose data to any law enforcement authorities to any re for any reason. And we think that's uh, something that everyone should strongly support. So I know I've highlighted a few shortcomings of MLATs as they're currently written. Um, but we agree with GNI that ultimately everyone benefits from a strong human rights protecting MLAT system. Uh, as, as I'm sure someone else will highlight at some stage, this is really a rule of law issue, and as I said, really an individual rights issue. All states benefit, all users benefit, and that's really key. Uh, so when we were doing our own consultations on this issue, and as I said, we spoke to uh, people from private companies, we spoke to DOJ, we spoke to other civil society organizations. We found almost universal agreement that the current process for handling MLAT requests in the US is subject to huge delays. I saw something about an average of 10 months for a response. Um, and that uh, it's not really that it's anybody's fault, but it seriously risks undermining the whole enterprise. And so we have, DOJ has asked for extra funding for this process, and we strongly support that call for extra funding. We've written to Congress and, and led a coalition of NGOs in calling on Congress to provide that extra funding. It's not just for DOJ, but it's also for some associated entities that tend to wind up handling these requests. And we think that's really key. Um, 
And I want to mention we're also concerned about the risk of data localization that might arise from the current inefficiencies in the process. In other words, one of the things that countries might do, if, so if we don't have a well-functioning MLAT process and they're facing huge delays in getting data, including from the US, we're worried that those countries, some of them may just turn around and require the data be stored in their own borders and that certain internet processes take place within their own borders. And we think that that would be uh, hugely complicating for one, not very human rights promoting either, uh, and not something that we wanna see. Uh, I know the GNI report has highlighted this problem and I think it was absolutely correct to do so. I, and maybe I'll end by saying that we're very happy to see that human rights are actually very central to what the report says. Um, because we agree that these things are critical not only for ensuring fair trial rights, but also for protecting free expression, freedom of association, um, the right to privacy, all of that from start to end of this process. And so we were glad to see the report say that any reform that doesn't comply with human rights won't be adequate because we fully agree with that, with that idea. So I'm looking forward to responding to questions, but thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Since we're going down the line, do I get to critique my own report? Well, I was thinking about that, and you could, but maybe we'll save that no, for the yeah, end. I'll How about if uh, Nicole goes? I would hope you would applaud it. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nicole Jones, and I work for Google, and I'm law enforcement and security counsel. And that is sort of a split role where I deal both with incoming requests for the disclosure of data via lawful legal process, as well as protecting Google um, and our, the privacy and security of our users' data and corporate data. And in those roles, the MLAT issue, it comes up really on sort of both sides. And as others have mentioned, it's very exciting to be in a room and in a time where people are starting to look at MLAT and care about it because this has been an issue for the providers like Google for years. Um, we've been dealing with the situation with MLAT and the responses we get when we tell requesting jurisdictions that they need to use the um, MLAT to obtain data, and it puts providers in a difficult position. And so we support um, the findings in Andrew's report that countries need to work together to improve the MLAT regime. So very uh, thankful that, that Andrew did this report and that GNI is publishing it, and um, hopefully that's going to start a dialogue. And as Andrew mentioned, several of the things in the report are common sense, easy things to accomplish, low-hanging fruit, that hopefully this conversation is going to get some of those things started. One of the, the points that Andrew made in his report that I, I, I'll start with is it's, it's sometimes easy to, to think you know, data disclosure is always bad and should be prevented, but we can't ignore that there are legitimate government interests for legitimate criminal investigations and public safety that are going to require the disclosure of data sort of cross jurisdictions. But the thing is, we can have that, and we can also have a regime that respects that various countries can have interests to varying degrees in the same data that need to be recognized and honored, and that we need to consider user privacy and human rights all at the same time. And I think that the report shows that this is something that can be accomplished. We just have to be thinking about them holistically. The providers, uh, the companies like Google and Microsoft, we're definitely part of the equation. We're holding the data that is often at issue in these cases, so we're part of it, but we're stuck in the middle. We are not governments. We do not sign on to treaties. We can't force other countries to comply with their treaties obligations, so we're stuck in the middle, and that's why the companies and Google are very much in favor of reforming or improving the MLAT regime and making some of these fixes come, come into order so that the process has a framework and clear guidelines and transparency so that everybody knows what's going on. Um, the White House is actually committed to improving MLAT from the United States perspective, and we applaud that and think that's great. Some of the things that have been mentioned is expediting the reviews, because if you ever talk to anybody who's involved in the MLAT process, the, the very first reaction they will have is, oh, it takes forever. And the, the belief then is that it's a waste of time to even try. And that needs to be resolved. And the MLAT procedure 
for a lot of countries is still back in the era of ribbons and almost like blood seals. And definitely Andrew's focus on, on sort of using new technologies and electronic forms would go a long way. And then finally trainings, um, OIA and DOJ are working on sort of going out and having outreach to countries about how to do a proper MLAT so that it doesn't get bogged down in the process. And we definitely support that and hope that other countries will also prioritize that as well. I think we would also say, though, that the, so the U.S. is hopefully going to be leading by example in, in the MLAT um, improvements, but also needs to be leading by example in reforming surveillance laws. So ECPA right now, it has bi re reforming ECPA has bipartisan support. Hopefully, we're going to get it across the finish line this year. That would be, it's, it's huge. Um, reforming uh, national security laws like the USA Freedom Act, those types of things are really important. And I bring them up in this context because it does have a relationship. It is not at all true that Google has um, given the US government or any government direct access to data. All data disclosure requests are handled individually on their own merits. But the misperception that the United States government has some sort of unfettered access to data is leading other countries to feel, well, they need that too, and to pass ill-advised laws of their own that are broad surveillance and moving us backwards from where we need to be with reforming these laws and not enacting new ones that are just going to cause more conflicts of laws. So hopefully one of the results of this will also be reform of the U.S. laws. Um, I think the one thing that, that people ask me is, why do you support improving the MLAT regime? Because as a result of that, it's possible that more data is going to be disclosed. And that is true, but our belief, and I think Sarah and Andrew have both touched on this, is that improving the, the MLAT regime is really, in the end, it's pro-user. It's better for everybody to have a clear process clear rules, transparency about what's happening, so that everybody knows what's going on, and we can all have a like informed, educated conversation about it. And the, the things that happen when you don't have a functioning MLAT regime, they've been mentioned, so I won't go over them again, but you know, data localization uh, laws are a huge problem. Um, laws that are purport to have extraterritorial reach, we're seeing that from a number of jurisdictions. You can also have the complete opposite, blocking statutes where countries actually want to block any, any disclosure of data, which leads to more conflicts. And one, it's something that I don't think Andrew or Sarah touched on, in addition to also more aggressive attempts to access data covertly, which is definitely not good for any of the parties involved, is there's also it increases pressure on the companies. So we definitely feel strong pressure sometimes from governments t for data disclosure. And the companies get stuck between a rock and a hard place where we have to comply with U.S. law, but then there's conflicting laws, and it's very difficult for us, and countries sometimes respond by trying to block our services, by threatening in-country employees with things like arrest or detention, and those types of results aren't good for the companies. They're not good for users. They're really not good for anybody involved, and all of these things right now are happening to a certain degree, and so that's one of the reasons we really support the concept of improving the MLAT regime to hopefully, hopefully stem the tide of that and start moving in a more positive direction. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Gail. Thanks, Jim. Um, so my name's Gail Kent. I come from the National Crime Agency in the United Kingdom. So I'm a law enforcement officer, and I've worked in UK law enforcement for 15 years, um, specializing in organized crime, and in particular in international crime. So um, first of all, congratulations to GNI on this report. Um, I think anything that gets MLA to be discussed is a fantastic thing. And also congratulations on getting a panel that's half men and half women. So <laughs> I haven't been in one of those before. Um, so what I was quickly gonna do was talk about the problem from a law enforcement perspective, um, and then mention a couple of the solutions. And then lastly say, um, probably most controversially, why I think we also need to go past MLAT. It's not just the only solution. 
Uh, I mean, the first thing to say is that you know, we have to recognize that law enforcement and state access to internet data is part of a much wider debate um, about how we use the internet, about government control of the internet, et cetera. So it's very much fits into that, um, into that framework. And I think we have to all recognize that, including law enforcement, in terms of having the debate. Um, the second thing um, that Andrew sort of mentioned um, is just about the way that crime looks nowadays. Now, I say I've focused on international and organized crime for uh, 15 years, but actually all crime is now international because it has an electronic element. And that can be everything from cyber crime, where the event where the, the crime is absolutely just taking place on the internet, to where you have crime where the evidence is being transferred on the internet, and that can be email, instant messenger, on a social network, whichever way. Um, and that can be a variety of different types of evidence from I'm going to kill him to um, the fact that two criminals are in, um, uh, in correspondence with each other. And then lastly, you have crimes where the individual, um, and that might also be the victim, has a digital profile. And, also that, and often that digital profile, particularly if you're looking at victims of abuse, whether that's um, domestic violence or child sexual abuse or people that have gone missing, that digital profile is really important. <coughs> and because of that digital element of all crime, basically you're now talking about all crime having an international element because that data is not stored within the jurisdiction where that individual is. And that is causing us a huge amount of problem. So if you look at... Um, the amount of requests that the UK makes for communications data generally annually, so law enforcement, we make half a million requests every year. And the vast majority of those are for crimes that are, or not even crimes, they're for identifying where missing people are, where vulnerable missing people are, um, where people are um, victims of abuse, and that can be child sexual abuse, or it can be things like cyber stalking. We, like most countries, have had an increase also in cyber bullying, where the police are being asked to being involved. But it can go up to, um, those requests will also cover more serious crimes like rape, like murder, and up to terrorism and the organized crime that, that, um, that I look at. Um, and doing some quick maths on the, on the back of, um, uh, of a notepad, only 1% of the requests that we make for communications data are actually for that level of terrorism and serious organized crime. The vast majority are for, um, for public safety or for the more generic crimes that you'd expect your local law enforcement to be looking into. And I think in, in looking at this debate, we absolutely need to, to recognize that as well. Um, and whilst there is undoubtedly more data, um, there's a greater supply of data, I think also when people know that that data is available so they know that their child has been on the internet talking to somebody, um, then they, they also expect um, that data to be used in terms of resolving that crime. And that is part of the problem that, that we are undoubtedly um, facing. So I think in terms of like the solution, absolutely, in, um, uh, as Andrew said, he, he talked to all the panelists um, uh, before writing his report. Um, there are some very low-hanging fruit, and there's much that we are doing and that we can do in terms of speeding up the process, recognizing that MLAT was written for a much slower age when things had to be done by post. And certainly in the UK, it's one of the things that we're looking at. How can we have an electronic MLAT system? Um, equally, you know, education is a really important part of it. We train our officers in our own legislation. We don't train them in recognizing what probable cause is. And there are, whilst I think in, in, um, in countries that, um, that have a very clear um, human rights framework and very clear rule of law, uh, that probable cause exists in some sort of format. How you write a, a request that covers probable cause compared to necessary and proportionate, which is our um, framework, is slightly different. And that does mean that you hit barriers when you're trying to make, um, when you're making a request for mutual legal assistance. Um, and equally, I think staffing is, is a big issue because if you look at the number of requests that the UK makes of, um, of the companies outside of MLAT, so for, for basic subscriber information, that's about 30,000 a year. If you're going to then increase that number and expect to be looking at um, a request for content, then 
undoubtedly you need to have the staff that can support that. And I know that, as Nicole said, that's something that, um, that the White House and the Department of Justice has asked for funding for and is doing. But I think we also need, and, and Angie touched on this report as well, we also need greater transparency for what you can get outside of MLAT, because MLAT isn't the only solution. Um, all of the companies do, or most of the companies, do provide um, not some non-content out of um, outside of MLAT, and I think that's really important when you're looking at the sort of crimes that I touched upon, because you wouldn't expect if there is a missing child or you're dealing with child sexual exploitation or there's an imminent um, a terrorist threat to have to go through mutual legal assistance, nor I think would you expect to use the, the full weight and administrative process for mutual legal assistance for something that doesn't have the same weight as, as content. And I think one of the things, and, and you do mention this in, um, in the section on improving MLA, is getting absolute transparency so that law enforcement does know what it can get under its own legislation um, by talking directly to the companies. And I think that level of clarity is, is, really, is really important. And then, so, but lastly, I said, I, I think we have to go past mutual legal assistance, and I think we have to look at what an international um, framework would look like. Um, and absolutely one that, that complies with, with all the principles um, that you've talked about in the, in the report. But I think that's really important for, um, uh, for two reasons. And one is, you know, if I send a message to, um, to my husband um, using this device, I have five different ways I can do it. I can send him a Hangout message, I can send it via Skype chat, iMessage, all of them. Or I can just send him a normal text message. Now, if I'm a criminal doing the same thing um, in the UK, if I use that text message, I can go to my court and I can get a warrant to ask the company for that content of that text message, assuming that, I am, uh, that I've gone through the, uh, I've proved that it's necessary and proportionate, et cetera, et cetera. Why do I have to get a US court to agree the same for a different, um, for exactly the same uh, content because it's used a different medium? That is, you know, that is one of the sort of like the strangest concepts that I can see within, within law enforcement. It's not to say that international human rights shouldn't be the absolutely most important thing, and I completely agree with that, and it's what I live and use every day, but I should have a process that, that respects my legislation, especially when that legislation ha you know, has, is up to those international standards of human rights. And I think we have to get to the stage that we're not trying to debate where the data is, nor where, and it's not where the data is based on where the company is, um, uh, is incorporated. It's not where the data is because of where it's stored. It's not where the data is because of the terms of reference. It's having a framework that, that recognises that governments, and, and Andrew says this in his report, government do have a legitimate interest in data of their own citizens committing crimes in their own country against, um, against other citizens of that country and where the, that data can be obtained in a much simpler and more straightforward process. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gail. Frank. Good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Frank Torres, and I'm a senior policy counsel with Microsoft. Um, I came to the company working on privacy issues, and in the aftermath of the Snowden disclosures, um, kind of got pulled into the government surveillance issue. Um, uh, and so all of these things start to to come together. Uh, f first of all, I really want to thank Jim and CSIS um, for hosting us today, and uh, to David and the GNI, the Global Network Initiative, for really bringing us together around this important uh, issue. Um, and thank you, Andrew, for your work on, a, on an excellent report. Um, I, I think it will be instrumental in helping to get uh, more attention uh, to the issue and, and provide us with a strong framework for, for moving forward. Um, it certainly lays out the challenges and makes the case for, for modernization as well as providing that, that course of action. And I think I'll join the course of, of voices that you heard up here. Um, I would say is, is as long as two years ago, if you were to ask, ask me if I'd be working on uh, looking at how to improve the MLAT process, my first question would be, MLAT, what the heck yeah. is that? Um, and it's still interesting to see how people try to um, 
come up with what the acronym actually stands for. Um, you know, I'll get a mail. Oh, Frank, are you working on that? You know, mutual legal aid stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, but look at where we are today and, and kind of look at how we got here. Um, certainly the internet, I think, has surpassed all of our expectations in, into how people um, in this now network society kind of rely on it as, as an instrumental tool as part of their lives and certainly part of how business gets conducted now no longer within countries but around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as we talk to more people about the issues, it's, it's somewhat fascinating to see, you know, companies both big and small become very interested in kind of the government surveillance issues and, and what it all means. Because even if you're a small company now, your goal, your aspirations is to, is to have an international reach or you already have one. Uh, you know, that's the power of the internet and that's the, the beauty of and what we all get, get excited about and want to improve upon. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 then we look at over the past 24 months and, 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 and the situations that have occurred kind of the acceleration of uh, events that touch on the safety aspects, the privacy aspects, um, the free expression aspects of the internet, from the Snowden disclosures to the cyber attacks on Sony to the recent tragic events in, in, in Paris. And what these events you know, highlight is you know, both you know, how we should be looking at this issue from a, a public safety national security perspective but also from a civil liberties and privacy perspective, and, and how do we bring these two together? Um, you know, what it shows us, we think, is the need to look at the laws, the existing laws, and, and perhaps adapt them to the technology that exists today, um, including modernizing existing processes, like that of the MLATs. Um, you know, the legislation and legal process has not matched really the pace of the technological change. Um, and so that's why we joined a, a group of companies including Google and Yahoo um, uh, and, and Facebook uh, around what we call the Reform uh, Government Surveillance Coalition um, that is calling for a, a change and a modernization of some of the uh, existing uh, laws around government surveillance and one of the proposals that we put on the table and the principles that helped kind of form the bedrock of, of this group is improving the AMLAP process, which kind of recognizes the need for a rule of law that governs you know, how law enforcement agencies and governments around the world um, can do their job and collect the data. Um, that they need to do their job, but l let's have a, a rule of law. And so that's what we think, you know, all this work kind of really makes clear is that we need solutions that will enable the rule of law to work well um, and more routinely across <coughs> national borders. And I think all of the, the respondents today have, have touched upon different aspects of that. Um, because companies shouldn't find themselves in, in the middle of this debate. This is the time for dialogue, the time for discussion, the time for governments and the public and, and the interested stakeholders like companies to come together to, to sort out what's the path forward in this new kind of global digital age. Um, so, so we need to make the current processes work better and we have that opportunities with the MLATs and as the report calls out kind of the, the notion of modernizing the MLATs, the, the whys and the hows and, and what we need to do to make that happen. Um, and so that's why we you know, so support what uh, the, support the report and, and its findings. Um, it's certainly consistent with what we have others have called for. Um, and it will help move the MLAT process into an era of electronic communications. Heck, we use it for everything else. Um, you know, my, my uh, the, 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 the vets that I used to take my dog to, you know, are all electronic. They're all very efficient. If we can do it for that, um, you know, very important thing for those of us that have pets, um, why shouldn't we have the same sort of process, processes and use, utilizing technology in all the right ways for something as important and as vital as um, the MLAT process? Um, uh, so we agree with all of that, and I won't repeat what, what's in the report. Um, we, we certainly agree with all of that. 
Um, but we also agree with um, the comments that, that Gail made that, you know, perhaps we also ought to think about, you know, going beyond just the MLATs. And the report lays out, you know, some of the rationale for taking a look at um, a, 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 an international treaty or convention, um, you know, that, that might be, uh, you know, kind of a, a long-term uh, solution that will help uh, drive a public dialogue and create even greater uniformity and address some of the issues um, that, that are currently on the table. Our, our general counsel, Brad Smith, spoke about this last week um, in Brussels, um, and uh, I would recommend his remarks to you. They can be found, um, and I'll just do a plug here for um, where, where you can find them, because I, I do re recommend them to you. It's just that, you know, uh, at our Microsoft on the Issues blogs. It's blogs.microsoft.com WAC on dash the dash issues. Um, and he talks about, uh, you know, the importance of uh, public safety and personal privacy um, and forging, uh, perhaps to begin with, a new transatlantic uh, set of legal rules that would better, um, you know, help with defining the rules of law for law enforcement with the appropriate safeguards to obtain the information needed for lawful investigations across borders. Um, and he just outlined some different aspects of this, um, you know, being able to provide uh, a mechanism for uh, directing legal service on, on data center operators, the, having a nexus between the country issuing the order and the sort of information that they're looking for, a clear standard for issuing that order here in the United States, certainly we rely on the probable cause standard, um, making sure that there's transparency, oversight, and accountability, and um, as other folks have commented, you know, the need for the respect of human rights, and that needs to be part of this process as well. So, you know, we think that, you know, that there, there are some, um, uh, you know, this isn't an easy process. We, we recognize that when it comes to international conventions, but if smart people come to the table and start to work through these issues, that while difficult, we think these ch challenges aren't insurmountable. Um, uh, again, thank you, uh, CSIS and GNI, for this opportunity, and look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Andrew, this is your chance for some uh, brief. Uh, I, it's hard to see what you're going to disagree with. But yeah, yeah. Give it a try. Yeah. Um, I, geez, I know I was expecting much more pushback. Um, I guess I'm. I'll embrace your embrace. Um, I, I do think it's. It's. I'll just reiterate what I said at the end. I mean, I really think that the challenge here is. There are two challenges. One is implementing the stuff that we all, it's just obvious how much we agree, which I think is quite surprising given the different perspectives that we have on these issues. Um, it, you know, going from a white paper, I was joking with a friend that this is such an important issue, so what we did was we wrote a white paper. Um, <laughs> going from that white paper to actually implementing it is actually going to be tricky, right? That's going to require leadership, the expenditure of political capital. Um, the incentives, the states that there is this problem of misalignment of incentives, the states that need to implement, for example, an incoming, an intake process for managing MLA requests may not have the incentive to make that process run terribly smoothly, right? It's the states that request MLA that are requesting state assistance that really want the U.S. to have an efficient system. Um, so aligning those, ascent, those incentives or recognizing that in the long term, we are going, as the, at the United States, going to be needing to request MLA as much or more than we currently receive MLA requests, um, which I think requires some, some leadership and some foresight, is going to be critical to implementing some of this low-hanging fruit. The second thing I would say is just that beyond implementation, I still think there's a great deal of work to be done in thinking through beyond, you know, all of us said um, human rights matter, right? But we, what we haven't figured out uh, as, as a matter of international law, as a matter of scholarship, we have not figured out what we're supposed to do when it comes to regulating the internet and one set of human rights values conflicts with another or one group's interpretation of what human rights mean directly conflicts with another group's interpretation of human rights. Um, these, kinds of, these kinds of conflicts of values that manifest themselves in conflicts of laws are deeper problems uh, yet to be resolved that I think merit further attention. Okay. Um, hmm. 
So I was thinking while you were all talking, I mean, one of the first things I did when I worked at the State Department was I got to deliver uh, what they call a letter rogatory, which mm -hmm. is between courts, but it's similar to this. I was really pleased because I'd never seen a document written on parchment before. <laughs> this was about 20 years ago. Yeah. For all I know, it's still pending. But, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I learned a couple things when I had to do that. And the, in some ways, sovereigns are very jealous of their prerogatives, and they don't give them up freely. And even little countries, I mean, I, always, I hear this from people, we are the hegemon, you should just be able to make countries do what you want. No, it doesn't work that way, right? And so little countries, particularly like Switzerland, they can be very stubborn, you know? <laughs> and they are jealous of their prerogatives. So something that we're asking them to do here is give up some of their prerogatives, and sovereigns don't do that. They don't do that unless there's a quid in it for them. So maybe the, you know, MLATs are a way to balance the, the, the you know, manage the balance between sovereignty, where they're very jealous, and extraterritoriality, where they'd like someone else to do something. Maybe you could all talk for a minute, and we'll throw it open to you. What's the quid here that will make people want to do this? What's the thing that they're going to get out of it? And, and I'm going to take one off the table. Don't say efficiency, right? Because sometimes sovereigns like being inefficient, right? What's a good way for me to guard my prerogative? I'll just take 200 years to answer your request. So what is the, what is the quid here? If I've stumped you already, I can go to another let, question. Let me just, I, I'll just give, I'll say one more word about what I was, what I meant by a vision or long-term thinking on this question. You know, the, the vast majority of the requests that Gail makes are to the United States because the vast majority of internet products, the, the biggest customer base is in the United States, right? How, how exotic is it that the idea that we might all start to have an app on our phone that was developed by a company that is not based in the United States or does not store its data in the United States, right? It doesn't seem very far-fetched. Many of you probably have a Waze on your phone. Waze now is a Google product, but it was an Israeli company originally, right? It seems inevitable that in the next few years there will be a, the market will take, be taken by storm by some app that wasn't, or product that was not developed in the United States and the data for which happens to be beyond the reach of the United States government. And the United States government will have a couple of options, right? One would be to do what they're doing in the Microsoft case and say, our laws apply wherever you are, which strike a lot of us as, a, as a overreach. Or they might find themselves in the unenviable position of a requester for mutual legal assistance. If you think that we are going to need to ask other states for mutual legal assistance, it might be helpful for those states to feel like we treat them well when they ask us for mutual legal assistance. That seems to me like a really not so exotic idea that, that would be smart for us to have to develop a process that pleases other people when they request information because it is inevitable that we are going to need to ask them for information. How much is this a U.S. problem? I mean, I think your point is a good one and eventually we know there's Chinese companies that are trembling yeah. on the urge of, they want to go global. Yeah. There's a few other places that want to go global. And so we will have a, a whether it's Korean or Chinese, we're going to have some sort of foreign app. But how much of this right now, Gesundheit, how much of this is just a U.S. problem, the fact that the big internet companies, service providers are mainly U.S., putting aside the telcos, how much of this is just U.S.? And does that impose special requirements on the U.S.? Please. Yeah. Um, when I first started looking at this, I also had exactly the same um, perspective as Andrew, that this is an international problem. Um, but ultimately, if, you, if, you, if you're just looking at normal communications data, so forget um, looking at cybercrime where you are looking at where data is flowing in a variety of different ways and could go through a variety of different servers. If you're looking at who's communicating with whom, when they're doing it, where they are, and what they're saying, then the vast majority is still um, in the US. So that does mean that there is, there is a, a, the balance isn't there at the moment. Um, I, think, I think that um, to, to sort of think about your question, I, don't, I, I genuinely don't know the answer to like, what is the benefit, because you, you ruled out efficiency. For law enforcement, it is efficiency. All, the, because all those who've worked in governments know that efficiency is not <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. Never... Okay, well, but efficiency is really important because the, 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 the people that I've found consistently absent in this or the stakeholder are the victims. 
So there are cases, and, and probably child sexual exploitation, which is a huge issue in, in, in the UK at the moment, and cybercrime are the two cases where the victims are notably absent because we are, we are not able to resolve issues as quickly as we can. And that's not, that's not about the companies not helping us because the companies do a lot to help us, but just where the internet provides a, you know, provides a problem, where we, don't, where we don't investigate cases where we can't get the data. Um, so I think that efficiency will make a difference to which cases we investigate, which will ultimately help the victims. But I also understand the difficulty of, comp of countries who are trying to balance the need to protect companies that are in their jurisdiction and making sure that those companies are complying with human rights with requests that are coming in for, from foreign governments. Because if the, if the US government was to suddenly say, oh, well, actually, Google, it's up to you to decide who you give data to, or Microsoft, who you give data to, then what sort of position are Google or Microsoft then when you get countries that don't have the same human rights mm -hmm. records as perhaps you know, European countries in making that decision? So I think the only sort of real benefit is the one that Andrew's talking about, is sort of like looking much longer term for the, to, for the US government of when the, when the internet is more global, how can there be a how there can there be a treaty or a, or a framework that enables them to get data as quickly? And I think the interesting thing in the in the Microsoft Ireland case, and I I generally don't know the answer to it, but I don't know if where the the crime took place or where the victim and the um, and the the criminal or or the, or the 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 person whose data has been requested are, because I think that would make a big difference in terms of how I would understand the case. Let me just add to that that it's not just even if you even if you're only looking at right now, um, there is you know the, the bulk of the requests are coming to the United States. So just in a volumetric basis, the United States is the core of the problem. But every country is dealing with this. I mean, when I spoke to people at UNODC and people at Interpol, they said we field on a daily basis. We field requests from Guatemala. They, they want to get access to data that happens to be stored in Venezuela. How the hell do they do that? Uh, they have no idea and they want guidance. So they're, you know, so, and UNODC and Interpol both have their own training documents um, in addition to the, the training that exists that the United States government does that, um, that, some, com that some companies do, but uh, there, is a, there is an MLAT problem at, in every country in the world. Um, you might think it's bigger or smaller depending on uh, the markets, but it's a problem that applies, I think, everywhere. So um, one of the things I was thinking about, I like the report a lot, and one of the recommendations that was in there that I thought was really interesting was the idea of some multilateral uh, approach, because that is more efficient and it does work in other areas. Um, but who owns the AMWET problem? Is it UNODC? Is it Interpol? Is it the G7? I mean, who, does anyone own it? Because if you're going to get a multilateral agreement, someone has to own the problem. Could anyone? Yes? No? Maybe? The Microsoft should take this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why Microsoft should take it. <laughs> um, you know, look, I, you know, I, I think ultimately it's a government-to-government -government issue, right? I mean, it's, it's, you know, how do you get the right people in the administration um, you know, which probably reaches, you know, DOJ as well as those at state and, and in, in, you know, perhaps, you know, even at the White House level, um, engaged and interested. I, you know, certainly this is something that the president has already talked about a January or two ago when he laid out his kind of vision and framework for uh, reforming the government surveillance laws here in the United States. So, um, you know, my, my I, I think the notion in people's minds is, you know, it's, it's the administration, DOJ, State Department, working with their counterparts abroad, um, you know, in, in, in the right uh, 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 you know, law enforcement and, and, and regulatory bodies um, in, in the other countries. But you're absolutely right. You know, at some point, somebody's got to say, okay, let's do this and kind of send out the notices for, I mean, Let's, you know, if you're talking about logistics here, it's, you know, who sends out the notice for the first meeting to say, this is an important issue, let's kind of bring it to the table. And I think, you know, what one view is that, you know, perhaps this is something that the, that the U.S. government should get uh, uh, started. And, and we hope that since the president has already talked about it, you know, Congress is already looking at um, increasing appropriations for 
uh, the Department of Justice um, to improve and make the MLAT process more efficient. Um, that, you know, I don't know of anybody who's, who's stood up and said, oh, no, 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 let's not do this. So then you're, at, yeah, I think that's exactly the right question. Like, let's, let's get it started and, and who, who, you know, who sends out the meeting invite, I guess, is what we're after. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you're if you're looking at who owns the so if we put aside the the solutions which um, which Andrew has suggested or so the, the low hanging fruit which I think um, there are a variety of different people working on if you're looking at who owns the whole problem it's a really difficult one practically because if you look at um, if you give it to the UN then we have consistently the UK and the US government rightly fought against a UN control of the internet. So, you know, are we going to then suddenly say, well, actually, UN, you can't control it in this way, but you can control this bit. And I don't think we're going to do that. If you go to um, sort of like some natural partners, so if you look at something like the Five Eyes, then yes, that, that might work, but you've got the thing, you're not really dealing with some of the more difficult problems. So the question is absolutely, who do you go? And I think it's being, it's being discussed in all of these fora. And I think my hope, um, and it was an ex-Microsoft person that, that said this to me, is that if you are having several conversations about this, then just like the internet came from several conversations and sort of fed together, then there will build enough body of steam that we will get to some sort of solution, but it'll be much more, um, it, it will not be a sort of like a top-down solution that comes about. It'll be one that is much more evolutionary and similar to the way that the internet itself was created. So on, on this question, I, the, just to be clear, the reason I threw this to Frank is because, you know, as, as he mentioned, Brad Smith, the general counsel of Microsoft, has been, um, I think, admirably pushing for an ambitious vision for a global agreement. Um, and it is true, as, as you say, that it is more likely to get multilateral or plurilateral agreement among a group of like-minded countries like the Five Eyes. It is also true, however, that the Five Eyes have, are in a political situation at the moment where trust in the Five Eyes views about government access to data is not especially high. Um, you know, the report, because I wanted to focus on things that I thought were tangible in, an, in a pretty complex um, scenario, the, f the report looked first at things that could be implemented unilaterally and, and for the most part and without legal change. Um, then I looked to things that would require bilateral legal reform, like reforming the existing agreements. And then finally, I think the, the fruit that's least ripe and most, the highest up on the tree, worth reaching for, but it's gonna take a while, is something like a, a regional or multilateral or global agreement. So, so, sorry, I misunderstood that. I thought you were talking about specifically about improving the AMLATs, which is, is one thing, but certainly, um, you know, our, our general counsel has, has talked about a, an international convention for, for quite some time, again, m m most recently, um, uh, uh, last week, and, that, and that's certainly important. And, and that's one that, you know, will require, you know, kind of the, the government to government um, d discussions and dialogues, and, and um, you know, we hope that kickstarts. And, and, but to Gail's point, you know, I think absolutely right. I mean, that the, the way that happens is we discuss it here, there's some more forms around it, some people smarter than I at least kind of really start to think, okay, what would this thing look like? Again, you know, we certainly know that it's it's that there are challenges, um, uh, you know, just in getting something like that going. I, I remember when I first started, kind of talking to people here uh, uh, about that idea. You get kind of the eye roll, like, oh my gosh, okay, how did like last time we did one of these things? It's, you know, but but that shouldn't deter us. You know, the the internet's a profound thing, and you know, the idea of kind of crowdsourcing and getting the, the right experts kind of talking about this. It's, it's definitely a worthy idea, um, and, and we shouldn't let the challenges deter us. It's really, again, something that's de definitely surmountable um, if, we put, if we put our minds to it. So I'm gonna ask one more question, then I'm gonna force you guys to ask questions. Um, I don't know how I'll do that, but I'll figure out some way. This question's a little harder, and there's a benefit to doing this bilaterally uh, and there might be a benefit to doing it on a like-minded basis. But if you're talking about a global treaty, having um, been in some, a couple global negotiations on this stuff, you're gonna run into a couple problems. And the problems you're gonna run into are 
uh, how do you prioritize what you want, right? And in particular, if you want a global treaty, you're going to have to ask yourself, what's the balance between human rights and reform? Where do we draw the, the balance here? Because there are countries globally, big countries, who probably will be um, important players in the global IT industry who don't share our views on information technology and on human rights. How do you make that balance? What would you think of the U.S. should think about? So I'm not asking you to say human rights is good and it should always take precedence. You can say that if you want. What I'm asking you to say is what is it we should think about if we approach a negotiation, either bilaterally or multilaterally, how is it we want to prioritize things? Where are the things we're willing to trade or be flexible <laughs> on? And I'm going to go down the road. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I might frame up that question slightly differently. I think at the get-go, it, it may not be a question of getting everyone, every country on board. Um, it may be a question of getting like-minded countries on board that have the, you know, it's the same or similar view around the importance of human rights and, and, and the role that that plays here and, and, and the need to be respectful and mindful and the need to have that as part of a vital part of the discussion and how this comes about. So you might not get everybody at the table, but that may be okay to start out with. Mm -hmm. And then and then you can start to work on the others once once things start to, to happen. So that, so that's how I would I would frame that up. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. And I think also that um, we probably aren't looking for a one track system. So you might have a system where you absolutely agree and it's quite clear and that doesn't need to go through MLAT, but you might then have a fallback system where something is more difficult, more um, contentious, um, and that would go through through a mutual legal assistance um, treaty uh, process. And then you've also got the option, as Andrew's pointed out in the last page of his report, of something like an independent clearinghouse. Mm -hmm. So something like the model that ICANN is, has gone to for, for, its, um, for resolving its issues. Nicole, what do you think about a clearinghouse and these issues? Go ahead, please. Um, I actually, I think I agree with, with both Frank and Gail on, on this particular point that we, we reframe the question a bit. I don't think balance is, is necessarily the word I would use, that we have to give on the privacy or human rights side necessarily, or, or that we need to prioritize one thing above the other. I do believe that you can have a system that respects both without needing to have a balancing that, that removes on one side of the scale or the other. And I think one of the ways to do that is with what Gail mentioned is you can have different tracks for things that are more difficult or that are more contentious and start with the things that we can all agree on that we all um, agree that are crimes and agree are the types of things that are legitimate uh, for investigation, get those into a framework. And all of the countries have, that is a benefit to everybody to have at least something where they have nothing right now. So that'll bring people to the table. And then once that starts to work, go to the tougher issues. Yeah, so I, I'm going to agree with everything that's been said that so that there in in many ways I, I reject the frame of the question it's not a zero sum game right you don't ha you don't have to necessarily trade off privacy for reform but i think to embrace the question there is a way in which i am i, I would love to be wrong about this but i am nervous um, and reluctant to full-throatedly embrace a global first approach to this issue because my fear is that their incentives are just so, um, or the interests just are so different that there's a risk that this ends up looking like other debates about internet governance where countries' interests and incentives are just lead them to a very different place and it might not be best to have a big, uh, a single conversation that is big and contentious and public um, rather than negotiating on a bilateral basis for the, you know, for the, for the best system we can get. So 
I have to speak from the perspective of an institution that, that I don't think we have an institutional position as to whether we would like to see a, a big multilateral treaty. Um, I think that it could certainly have benefits. I also, I want to agree with you, Andrew, that it's not a zero-sum game, and I think part of what we're saying here, all of us, is that greater efficiency could benefit human rights in that, you know, certain states would not then, or perhaps be less tempted to engage in sort of strong arming practices to get what they want. Um, so I think that it's not necessarily the case that there's a, a trade-off between efficiency and human rights. Um, I think I, my hesitations would come from the general climate that we're in right now. I think that states right now are likely to be overwhelmingly advocating for law enforcement interests rather than, say, individual rights necessarily, um, especially looking at data retention proposals that are coming out of various states. Um, including the Five Eyes states. There's a huge state interest in, in getting as much data as possible, and sometimes for legitimate reasons. Uh, that's more in the national security context than the law enforcement context per se, but I, I think that we would have reason to be nervous about negotiating something in this particular moment. Having said that, um, we could really benefit from a process that has a, a truly multi-stakeholder model. So as I mentioned, the state uh, defendants have to rely on those letters rogatory, which are uh, from what I understand, I've never dealt with one, but incredibly slow, very uncertain. You're not guaranteed to get one. You basically have to ask the judge for one and, and hope that he or she agrees. Um, but if we had a, a consultative process that was truly multi-stakeholder, where law enforcement was represented, where um, defendants were represented, where the human rights community was represented, states, all of that, then we might be able to see a process that, that struck the balance well. So although I don't know how to strike that balance myself, and I don't know that CDT does either, um, I think that having a mix of voices is key to getting it right. I, I just would utter the caution that having actually negotiated some of these things, don't pretend you're not gonna be able to avoid trade-offs. So, but that's ways, I also agree that I wouldn't take a global approach, because, you know, jeepers. <laughs> um, <laughs> With that said, I have loads of questions, but it would be nice to hear from you out in there in the uh, audience when we get some, oh my goodness. Uh, why don't we just go down the row and we'll do it uh, in rank. So we'll start in the front and we'll go one, two, three, four, five. Go ahead, please. And could you introduce yourself sure. to the crowd? We have a, we have a microphone. Uh, I'm Tony Rutkowski, and um, I've got some good news, bad news. Um, I spend most of my time dealing with these kinds of issues outside of the U.S. Uh, and I indeed found out about Andrew because one of the participants in that dialogue globally uh, made me aware that he existed in the U.S. and was engaged in this activity. So uh, the good news is uh, for the last probably eight years, the technical mechanisms for doing this have been underway. Uh, in fact, I was the rapporteur in the international group for coming up with the initial technical report to in implement it. The general problem is electronic warrants and the subset is MLATs. In fact, there's an MLATs use case uh, in the report. Uh, the ongoing specification to, um, to implement it uh, has been underway for the last year. Uh, that is being led by one of Gale's uh, counterpart organization, affectionately known as NTAC. And it has buy-in from basically law enforcement people, pr providers around the world. Um, and there's a meeting actually in two weeks if anyone wants to go to the next iteration. They occur about every six weeks. What's been notice noticeably ac absent, however, is if, uh, what I would call most of the U.S. providers. Uh, Google doesn't ever show up, Microsoft doesn't ever show up, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I've actually tried to make that happen. Um, there isn't been a lot of interest in the U.S. There is an enormous interest worldwide. I've got the Indian government engaged in this activity. They want to uh, basically implement the capabilities. Indonesia, you know, you can sort of run down the line. So that's the bad news, is the players in some ways that have uh, interest, certainly in the, uh, the initiative that's underway, have simply not been participating in the ongoing activities to make this happen at the technical level. Uh, I'm both an engineer and a lawyer. Uh, I, I put my lawyer hat on and I, like Jim, uh, have dealt with the treaty 
treaty instruments for years, uh, that's prob that's, that may be intractable. But certainly the, on the technical side, the mechanisms for doing this uh, are underway, uh, and uh, I think there are options uh, that include the use of clearing houses. And I represent one of those clearing houses, actually, and we got running code to do this. Um, and then last but not least, I would point out, um, and Jim will probably appreciate this, uh, in many respects, this is not a new problem. There are transnational providers that have been around uh, for a couple decades. They're called uh, global satellite providers. They've had to deal with this problem. And there are a lot of solutions that have been worked out in those venues that are applicable here, too. So um, I guess uh, my uh, plea here is for uh, additional resources for the ongoing activities. Any uh, reaction from the group? And you could just pass it right behind you. We'll wait for this and see if we get a reaction. Yeah, so, 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 so maybe after the, the, the panel's done, I'd, I'd like to get... Oh, sorry. After the panel's done, I'd like to get more information just to follow up with you. I'm not quite sure why we're not participating. Um, you know, it could be a, a lot of different reasons, so I won't even speculate, but, um, but I'd like to find out more and, you know, tr try to see what we can do. Um, I'm Rich Wilhelm. I recently retired from uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, where I led uh, all of our business with the intelligence agencies. And to answer your question, yes, Ed Snowden did work for me. And uh, uh, no, I'm not uh, going to go into a whole lot of detail about that today. But uh, prior, uh, prior to um, uh, joining Booz Allen, I had a lot of experience inside the government as an intelligence officer, including um, being the White House's point man on uh, an issue that uh, was very similar to this one, Clipper Chip, which, Jim, I know you uh, are very familiar with, though. Um, I'm struck uh, by, I'd like to get a sense of the panel that, uh, you know, in today's sort of technological world, at the point of collection, you don't know whether it's a good dot or a bad dot. I mean, you, you mean generally, that's, generally that's true. And that seems to me to present a real dilemma. And when I hear, um, uh, I know no more about what I read in the press, um, that um, this uh, person in France who went off to Syria, Hayat Boumedin, 500 phone calls to the wife of uh, one of the uh, shooters, uh, and Charlie Hebdo, uh, it's sort of and I don't know whether they discovered that after the fact or whether they were tracking that or whatever. But is it a sense that uh, the ideal solution would be perfect protection of privacy and uh, allowing law enforcement and intelligence to have access to this sort of thing? I agree with everything you're saying is that we should try our best to balance the things, but is there a sense that there is going to be, in this technological age, is the balance going to fall in a way that, you know, that there will be some uh, uh, giving up on the part of privacy in order to make this whole thing work, relative to what certain constituencies would want to have and you know I you know as a lifelong intelligence officer I believe in privacy but I you know I remember Whit Diffie when he was testifying before Congress on privacy and we talked about this ideal solution he said to the senators he said what makes you think that perfect privacy and perfect law enforcement are compatible that, you know, that these are competing things and that you're going to have to find some new balance. Uh, and I don't think we found it yet. I think we're exploring it. I think all the efforts to do it. I'd just like to get a sense of some of the panel on that. Go ahead, please. And I'll speak at once. Um, so we've got a really strong view on this. Um, uh, and that's that basically law enforcement comes down to um, public consent. And it's for the public to, um, through their um, elected representatives, to, to look at what actually that means in reality. Um, so what we're trying to do in, in the UK is very much encourage a, an open and balanced debate. Um, and so we don't think it's for us to come up with what the solution is, but to provide some of the problems that we're facing. 
Um, so I don't know what the, I, I, even within our own agency, we have um, cybercrime as one of our responsibilities. And obviously encryption plays a big role in preventing cybercrime. But at the same time, you have use of encryption, which stops us um, accessing the details of some of our other or targets. So the three problems that we're facing are encryption. I mentioned just the number of different of devices, the number of different uh, media that you can you can communicate over. And then lastly, the international issue. And we think that those three things have to be part of this debate about how do you get that privacy and security coming together? And what actually does security in the case of like a Charlie Hebdo attack look like? And the, you know, how does that look like compared to like, the, the need for, for privacy? But absolutely, that has to be done. That has to be a debate and an informed debate that takes place with our um, elected representatives. <coughs> sure. So if I understand your, your question correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it's, it's essentially, are we necessarily going to have to trade away some of our privacy or privacy rights in order to achieve the level of security that we want in order to basically enjoy our rights? Uh, essentially, yes, but I'm not talking about wholesale trade. Mm, but some... Definition, uh, right. I, so... I mean, the right to privacy, obviously, of course, it's, it's never been proven. I mean, it's never been held absolute, but certainly in this technological age. Right. So I think a, a couple of... of points I would make in response to that, and these are things that I also raised at a conference in Brussels last week. It's interesting that, yeah, so the right to privacy, I mean, privacy inherently is something that is not absolute, but one thing I would point out is that in Europe and under the international human rights system, privacy is a much stronger value than perhaps it is here. I think the, the pride of place that we give to the First Amendment is the pride of place that they uh, tend to give to privacy and that the human rights system also often gives to privacy. Um, and so I think we need to really be mindful of that and to think about the fact that in many ways these challenges are not new. We've dealt with serious security threats before in the US and in Europe. I mean starting from a, more than 100 years ago obviously um, and we've dealt with questions of surveillance, of data collection, of getting access to information like this before. Maybe it didn't look exactly the way it does now. Courts have Courts have faced these questions. In particular, I'm thinking of the European Court of Human Rights, which has dealt with cases arising from the Irish, Irish troubles, uh, arising from struggles in, in the two Germanys way back when, arising from the situation in Russia, all sorts of things, and has consistently really come down in favor of individual privacy rights. So to the extent that we think this is new or different, I would maybe ask us to consider why it is that, that we think the balance needs to be struck differently this time, and to really be cautious about letting ourselves be pulled in by the sheer horror of some of the things that have happened this month and realize that you know things of things of that sheer horror have also happened in the past and so are we prepared to make the trade-off differently than we have before and i as a final point i i want to suggest that privacy is not the only right that we need to think about this in respect of i mean we all know that surveillance or law enforcement ability to get at data or communications or other things can burn the right to free expression as well. So especially as Americans who hold free expression very dear, to the extent that we think we're willing to trade away some of our privacy, we ought to ask ourselves whether we're willing to trade away our freedom of expression as well. And I would really, really prod all of us to think about that. Uh, let me just say, um, I'm always wary when questions about privacy and national security begin with the description of a terrorist act. Um, I just don't think it's a useful way of thinking about these problems, but it is a serious, it's a serious question and a serious problem. If I were, based on the conversations I had with people in preparing this report, if I were looking at every single instance of whether or not we grant government access to user data, in some instances I would flip the lever to increase access, and in some instances I would flip the lever such so as to reduce access. Now does that Flipping all of my switches, does it net out to granting government more access to user data than the government currently has? It's really hard to know because it's hard to know how much data the government actually has. I mean, it's just, um, it strikes me that what Gail said is absolutely true, that user trust, citizen trust is critical to the conversation over how, mu how to strike the right balance between privacy and security. Um, but there's not a lot of trust in the system currently, and that's partly, the, that's partly government's fault. I mean, I think governments that want to have the conversation about moving, you know, 
opening up a conversation about how to strike this balance correctly have shot themselves in the foot by um, not inviting that conversation sooner. And, and, and that's a, a, a really good point. I mean, you, your question goes to kind of some of the, the fundamental values of, you know, at least our democratic society and, and where to strike the right balance between, you know, our, our liberties, but also national security concerns, especially in, in today's environment. And, um, you know, I go back to the Snowden revelations about some things that the government was doing and reports coming out and kind of the aftermath of those revelations about, you know, tapping right into, you know, the lines of, of some companies um, kind of going around due process. And it was things like that that I think went beyond the pale for uh, many of our companies uh, as well as the, 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 the public. So, you know, tr trust is a huge issue and, and, you know, it's created a, you know, at a company level, a, a deficit for us, not just with the public, but you know, with, with our customers both here and abroad about you kind of what's, you know, what are you letting law enforcement in? And, and as Nicole said earlier, you know, the perception is, oh, you know, you're just allowing government unfettered access. So we, we, we need to kind of get back to, um, you know, kind of the, the, the rule of law and establish the right process and procedure. And I would, you know, argue that that's, you know, why we're here today talking about the MLAT process is kind of one piece of that to, to kind of help restore that trust and order by setting out the, the, the rules of the road and in, in the case of the MLATs where, you know, the process might not be as efficient as it could be or, or as good as it could be, you know, how, to, how do we get that kind of on track? Just as a footnote, one of the, I thought this earlier in the conversation too, is one of the problems we have is that very often people think that the U.S. government acts like their own government. And Rich knows this very well. In many of the major European countries, the level of surveillance is overwhelming. And the level of uh, oversight, legislative oversight, or legal rights is uh, underwhelming. And so one of the dilemmas we have here that we haven't talked about is uh, reciprocity to some extent. I mean, I, one of the last things I had to negotiate was of what we used to call lawful access to communications. And I never found a European country that did not surveil its own stuff. Now, they may not say that in public, but one of the things that's troubled me in this debate, and I don't pay any attention to the ESA, even the Europeans tell me not to pay attention to the European court, um, you know, because they don't have, they don't have uh, oversight over security matters. And so that goes behind a cloud. How do we deal with that? I mean, it would be nice if there was an internal debate in the U.S. at the start of this known thing, should we tell the rest of the world what we know about their surveillance activities? And that was decided against, and I'm kind of regretting it now. Sorry, can I just say one thing? The European Court of Human Rights does have oversight over surveillance uh, or sort of national security matters. It's the, the EU, the Court of Justice of the EU. Technically, national security is outside of the scope of what it's supposed to cover. I'm not... I'm, not sure I'd hold Europe up as a, a precedent, but Europe has a, a better record than most places. So that's, that's one of the dilemmas we're going to wrestle with here, I think. And MLETs are limited in a way because people want them to be limited. And so how do we get through that? MLETs are inefficient because people want them to be inefficient. How do we get through that? I would say there's some evidence to support that. It's not conclusive. Uh, Tom Goldberg, I'm one of the founders of Lineage. We make secure uh, IT hardware. Uh, just th three comments and then a request, if I could. Andrew, I would not blame the government for the use of data any more so than I would Facebook for mining it and monetizing it in almost the same way, purposes being different, outcomes being the same. And in the days of data mashing with Palantir and things of that nature, uh, creating mosaics about individuals that are b better in clarity than people themselves know about themselves. Uh, Frank, let me just say thank you. Accountability is probably the single most important element uh, with regard to this because at the end of the day, it's the integrity of the data that's being shared. Every bit as important as the method by which it's shared. And I think accountability there and s building it in to this process it really has to dovetail in this process, or the sharing 
has marginal value, and we actually have some ongoing U.S., Europol, Interpol uh, friction over that because of the equipment that is being used by our counterparts on the continent. Uh, Gail, thank you, thank you. I'll never, ever text again while in the U.K., so I'm in your debt for that. So again, let me just come back to my request. I can only get it if you're actually committing a criminal offence, and I can prove that to a judge. I, we're not. I mean, it's one of the sort of like the misconceptions. I think that um, that law enforcement has access to absolutely everything. It's not quite that simple. Nor would I want it to be. Now, having also come out of government and intel type of activities, some of my relations are never quite sure whether I am a criminal or not. But in any case, thank you. I will avoid using that for purposes. But the, again, the request here. There are an awful lot of activities going on, uh, transatlantically at least, that uh, really are trying to get at the fundamental question of how to share. Machine to machine correspondence and, and interactions. I take this gentleman's comment about uh, the satellite industry being very effective in having done that. There are some very good lessons learned there. I think the MLAT process should dovetail again here, pick up the good lessons learned. Be careful, though, that you build in this one last thing, this, this being my request. The speed with which we are marching technologically, and I think, Frank, you mentioned that, or uh, I th I'm going to give you credit uh, in any case, is eclipsing our ability to manage it. So I think you have to build that in. And I think there has to be a mechanism in these debates and in any negotiation that attempts to create a framework where we sanctify certain principles. Maybe it is privacy, maybe it's uh, sovereignty, maybe it's individual rights and liberties. Uh, uh, but it has to be built in, in in a much more fundamental way. And, and this gets to ways in today's paper, it turns out the LA uh, police chief wants ways to take down the ability of people to uh, identify where police are located. And that's a debate, uh, illustration. Uh, it's the content as well as, as its integrity and you have to begin to be uh, cognizant of that and build it into your MLAT process. Thanks. While we're waiting for the microphone to pass around, let me ask a question out of that, which is maybe for our uh, private sector representatives. What are company responsibilities when it comes to this kind of data? What would make it easier for companies to deal with? I mean, how, when you think about these problems, what is it you would want to see? The report is good, so, but when you think about Microsoft, Google, whoever, what is it you feel like you have to do and how do you balance how do you internally make the decisions on how you balance competing national laws on privacy, on data sharing, on law enforcement? Well, it, I don't think, again, that it's necessarily, um, at least currently, a balance where a U.S. company, a law-abiding U.S. company, and we comply with, with U.S. law. Um, we also, one of the reasons we're so supportive of um, improving MLAT is our clear understanding that there are other <coughs> countries in any given request or piece of data, there can be multiple countries that have a sovereign interest of some form in the request and that that also needs to be considered and part of the process. But I think one of the biggest things for us on the company side is the transparency aspect. The vast, vast majority of our users including probably almost everyone in this room, are law-abiding citizens properly using our products and services to go about their days. And we can't forget that when you have, you know, tiny pockets that are misusing the system and you can throw out the parade of horribles and suddenly say we should have a surveillance state, that isn't the right way to approach this from our perspective. And I think what we want is a situation where, you know, so like Gail mentioned before, it's really a societal decision where how to strike the balance between security and privacy. And what we want as companies is to make sure that we protect the expectations of our users and that we can be transparent with our users about 
the data disclosure requests that we receive and what's going on so that everybody knows and can have an informed conversation. Uh, Andrew mentioned sort of the, the levers, and I think Yes, there are levers involved here, but we need to know what those levers are as a society before we can make the, the decisions about how we want our laws to be to protect both the security of our countries <laughs> as well as our individual privacy interests. And to say that we can't know anything that's going on behind the scenes and the companies can't be transparent about these requests is not going to help that conversation. I love the Google report, and I love it even more when countries scream about it. So it's really been a great, uh, I don't know, did uh, Frank and then I don't know if uh, Sarah or Andrew want to chime in? So, so I, I think we'd, we would uh, c concur with, with everything that, that Nicole said. I think the way that, you know, we've really started to frame this up is, you know, l l let's follow a rule of law. And, and where there is no rule of law, let's clarify it. Let's, you know, update ECPA. Um, you know, let's look at surveillance reform. Um, you know, so, so take those steps to, so that it's clear um, to our customers, to the public, you know, hopefully through a lot of government, uh, a lot of public debate and discussion about what the expectations are of companies. Don't put us in a position of having to figure out when, you know, different requests come in, you know, whose country's laws are we going to violate today to fulfill this request? Um, you know, I, I really respect and admire uh, the folks in our company who are, are, you know, are in Nicole's role of having to feel the requests coming in. Um, trust me, none of them would look good in prison orange. I, they just won't. And so, you know, help us, you know, help us government sort, sort, sort this out. Anyone else? Um, my name is Stan Sepp, I'm from the Embassy of Estonia. Um, and and um, I, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a lo law enforcement officer, so um, please bear with me. But uh, um, I was just wondering, and uh, absolutely agreeing with Jim uh, on, the, um, on the notion that it, it's very difficult to, to get some countries on board in any kind of, kind of development on MLATs. Um, and the question that I'm wondering is, is whether uh, we also have any kind of information how the current MLATs can be implemented, um, especially with uh, countries like uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, because uh, at least for our ex in, I mean, our experience, experience shows that uh, sometimes bigger, bigger neighbors, and I'm not, I'm not talking about Latvia, um, tend not to <laughs> fulfill these um, th these uh, agreements. Um, and special for political reasons. Thanks. Let me just say, I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons we highlighted transparency is because it's not just because it's a value unto itself, right? It's an, it's absolutely critical. I think with any process, if you if you're thinking about it sensibly, you need to be able to evaluate it, right? Whether you're a citizen or a corporate manager, you need to be able to evaluate it. That requires metrics. That requires information. And we just don't have enough information. I mean, I spent months on this report, and it was hard to get a sense from some governments how they managed the MLA process. Um, so, one of, so one of the reasons for the call for more transparency is just that. And I, I would just add, too, just to link these two pieces, that the discussion, I, I'm a big fan of the corporate transparency reports that I think fill an important gap in how much we know about where our data goes. But they, when it comes to MLATs, they have a particular problem, right? So they report U.S. In their U.S. numbers, U.S. government requests for information, those include requests for information that actually originated in a different country but came through the U.S. via the MLAT process. Changing, changing the company name. Yeah, so um, it is not always the case, but <laughs> it is, like, yeah. Because I know a couple of companies have, sorry, a couple of companies have come back, come back and said they've specifically, and I don't know about Google and Microsoft, yeah. but they've specific, specifically looked to try and work out which of the MLAT requests. Oh, they, they would love them. to be able to work it out, yeah. but, they, but it, in, to their, I mean, to their credit, they would yeah. love to be able to work it out, but it does, sometimes it arrives yeah. in a package that says this came via MLAT, yeah. and sometimes it's just yeah. a local law enforcement request and they don't know where it comes from, so. Exactly. Um, more transparency at every step of this process would be useful to under, for, for everyone, I think. Okay. Um, just on, on how you implement MLAT, so 
the a mutual legal assistance treaty is just a framework. It usually, and I know a lot more about UK MLATs than obviously any other country, but it has a, a clause that says, if you don't, if this goes against anything that your country isn't comfortable with, I'm paraphrasing, but then you don't need to, to comply with it. And the reality is that countries use their own legislation. Um, you know, the MLAT sort of provides the bridge, but you use your own legislation at um, the sort of the start and the finish of it. So you think it's, it's most clear in the in the US um, case because it's a US court order that then gets served on, on the companies. But certainly when we're looking at it, we use our um, Crime International Cooperation Act that then allows us to do the start part of it. And the MLAT just provides the framework. So in itself, it doesn't, you, you, you know, it doesn't compel the country to do anything. It's a bit of paper like any sort of international paper. And it's really up to the countries to decide how they then go about interpreting them and implementing them. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm Jorge Carrera, Justice Councillor at the Spanish Embassy. This question would be addressed to Nicole. Uh, you mentioned uh, an initiative, a White House initiative on, on MLA. Uh, could you please elaborate a little bit more about it, please? Yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned an initiative, a White House initiative on MLA. Uh, could oh. you please elaborate a little bit more about it, please? So well, my understanding and, and from the, the company's perspective and what's been uh, announced publicly was that this is a priority for the current administration to and a priority they're seeking funding for, which is to improve the technologies that are involved in the processing of um, the mutual legal assistance requests. So right now it's still, it's crazy to think that it's still a very paper driven process, but it, but it is. Um, another aspect of that is um, training. So one of the big problems that we hear w when we, we hear from other countries, and I, I think everyone can understand, is that the law enforcement out in the field don't necessarily know all the steps and what they have to go through to get the MLAT. And it's easy to sort of, it's easy to sort of blame the US government for being slow, but I think as Gail will tell you, there are multiple steps on the countryside that also yeah. slow it down. And I think one of the problems is getting the local law enforcement who are actually the ones that have the request and the incentive to push it through, make sure they know how to do it and how to do it properly so that it can go through all of the systems without being kicked back out for not having the, the right information. So I think one of the initiatives that the DOJ is working on now that we support is actually sending a delegation to these countries to do training to the law enforcement on the ground about how to write an implant that's going to actually get all the way from start to finish. Great. Um, two last questions and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we got one in the back and then one in the front. Hi, I'm Sarah Cortez. I'm a researcher from Northeastern University in uh, computer science in routing network paths, uh, routing internet packets and path selection algorithms. And so I'm interested in uh, the effect of MLATs on um, certain aspects that we study incorporating uh, in our network path selection algorithms. And I'm interested in knowing whether you have any metrics on the size of the issue. And I know that Google and Yahoo and a lot of other people have transparency reports. And I know in your report, Andrew, that you noted that you know many warrants come through to Google and Yahoo that you don't even know whether they're related to MLATs or not. And that's part of the problem. But I'm just interested in knowing if you have any metrics uh, right now on the number of requests and the backlog at OIA. I, I don't have information on, on any backlog that might be at OIA. I know from the, the company perspective, when we do recognize that a request is MLAT, and like Andrew said, we don't always know. OIA, if, a lot of times, will try to make it clear that it is, in fact, an MLAT request. And one of the reasons for that is the companies understand that if it's gotten all the way to us, an MLAT request, that there's been months of work leading up to that. And so we try to prioritize those requests when we do get them so that we are not the backlog. Um, and that we are not part of the, the problem in terms of the efficiency of the system. But I, 
it's like Andrew said, it's hard to have good metrics because there's no requirement that we are told that it's an MLAT and a search warrant that is from an MLAT looks exactly the same as a search warrant that's purely domestic. So we, we have struggles with being transparent as we would want to be about the MLAT requests because we just, we don't know what we don't know. Not only do we not know how many requests are in the system, we don't know how many requests. The more important number, I think, is how many are in the system uh, for, an, uh, for a needlessly long period of time, right? There are requests that came in yesterday that ought to be there, and if they could be processed efficiently, it doesn't matter if it was five requests or 5,000 or 500,000, that's fine. Um, it's, it's, it, the, the question has to be how many are there that could have been processed had we had better training, a more an electronic system, uh, better intake sit management um, that are sitting there and languishing. And that's just, you know, we don't have, I don't think anyone knows the exact number. Last question. Hi, hey, uh, Joe Marks from Politico. I have two questions for Nicole. Um, the first is whether, does Google uh, agree with the position in the Microsoft case that when data is stored solely abroad, it should only be accessed through an MLAT? And then secondly, sort of same question, but specific to the WikiLeaks emails that were talked about earlier this week. I've been trying for, a couple of days now to find out whether that data was stored in US servers, and if not, whether MLAT was part of the process to acquire. And I'm hoping you can either answer that now, or if you don't know the answer, if you can kick the right doors for me. Well, I'm glad to see that you saved the easy questions for last, <laughs> <laughs> and for yeah. me. If, yeah. if so. I had known, I would have cut it off at that. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there's there's two questions there. I'll, I'll take them in order. I'm, I'm sure that. I won't be able to satisfy you fully on, on either of them. Um, but regarding the, the Microsoft Ireland case, obviously we're watching it very carefully. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting case. Uh, from what we've seen, it's been briefed very well. And we are watching that to see how it turns out. Um, one thing to keep in mind, just when you're evaluating that type of situation, is that different companies have different architectures and infrastructure. So what might make sense and um, apply to one company in one situation may not apply at all um, to the way another company is set up in terms of their infrastructure or in terms of their actual architecture about how and where um, data flows or in terms of your terms of service. So I think there are a lot of things to unpack there, which is one of the reasons that Andrew's report didn't actually answer the overriding question of how do we decide <laughs> jurisdiction? Because there are so many different competing models and the companies are so different. But we are watching it and, and are hopeful that um, regardless of how that particular case turns out, that the conversation that that case has started amongst the companies and um, the countries about potential legislation to address the concerns maybe about um, the reach of US um, legal process. Regarding the WikiLeaks case, I mean, that's very difficult for me to talk about because we don't talk about on ongoing cases. And I, you know, I wouldn't tell you if I knew um, but I also can't tell you um, the answer to your question because I don't know. But also for the security of any user, I wouldn't answer that question to anybody to uh, tell you where it is exactly that Google is storing your data so that there's a map for somebody to target to try to access it. I mean, from a security point of view, that, that is not um, something that I think anyone would actually want um, and something to keep in mind when you're thinking about data location issues. But um, what, we've, what we have done on the WikiLeaks case that you know, is now public is our policy is when we can to give notice to our users about these requests. Unfortunately, in a lot of these cases, we're not allowed to because the legal process comes with gag orders. Now, in the WikiLeaks case, we have challenged many of the orders that we've received and fought to be able to give notice. Um, and you're seeing the results of that now. And, um, you know, I, it's a good thing. It, maybe, it, maybe it doesn't seem like that sometimes uh, when, when we're in the middle of the swirl. But this is what we want, right? The discussion about it so that everybody knows that it happened and we fought for that. So, yay yeah, us. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so I just want, uh, hopefully people can keep that in mind. And we're continuing to 
fight to unseal more of the related pleadings to hopefully answer um, some of these questions. And, you know, obviously we continue to argue for surveillance reform of the U.S. laws that are related to all of this. So uh, that's about all I can say. Can I just say one thing? Because we're, we're at a panel about, not about Microsoft Ireland, uh, but about mutual legal assistance. If you're writing an article about Microsoft Ireland, mention mu mu mutual legal assistance because it just, it's, it's, it's there in the briefing, but when you look at news articles about the case, it ends up discussing this question of whose definition of jurisdiction should win, should the United States government be able to claim this extraterritoriality. Um, lurking in the shadows is this underlying question of whether or not we do have or should have an efficient and fair system for sharing information from government to government. The United States government tells other governments hey, use MLA. When the United States government wants information from Microsoft that's stored in Ireland, Ireland says, hey, use MLA, and the United States government says, why would we want to do that? Well, that's a good note to close on, David. I don't know if you uh, wanted to say anything at the conclusion. Uh, you should step up to the, step up to the plate. Uh, no, really, just to say thanks, everyone. Again, you know, I think it's a, it's this is a, a milestone to get folks in the room for a, a public discussion about MLA reform, putting this on the agenda. Uh, looking forward to working with everyone here uh, to take it forward. Uh, and big thanks to uh, to the, our to our panelists today. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for coming.